Hi, welcome to NDE TV. I'm Peggy Robinson. Today's guest is Paulina Howfield, and she's going to tell us about her near death experience. So, hi, Paulina. Hi, Peggy. Thanks for having me here. Um, feel free to start wherever you like and take as long as you like. Okay. Well, thank you. Uh, again, thank you for inviting me to share my story with you and with your listeners and viewers, whatever we call them on channels. I'm not always sure about that. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about, well, talk about what happened, and then I'm going to talk about, I guess, what I got from it. Um, and it may jump around a little bit in that, but that's the general plan. <laughs> um I had the NDE in the 1980s and it has strongly influenced my life uh, but it also was something that while I didn't ever expect to have an NDE, it was not something in my go-to list or my bucket list, um, I knew about them. I um, had a very strong uh, spiritual urge, spiritual sense as as a child. So uh, that will be something that I'll talk a little bit about as well. Um, I'm kind of humming and hawing because I always find it interesting to share my story because our stories are deeply personal and it doesn't mean it's a secret and I don't tell anybody. And I've shared my story on numerous occasions at conferences and um, in places like this. But every time I do it, I can feel the vibration of it coming into me and the changes and the uh, sense of amazingness, if you like, around it. So, And it's also, it was a very telepathic and nonverbal experience. And so even though over the years that my understanding of it has changed and grown, it's still a, a telepathic nonverbal experience and sometimes the words just don't cover it. So it's a very strange medium to talk about it. Um, so when I um, was young, I had a near-death experience. I was on a soul quest. I've always been interested in soul. And I had traveled to many places and continue to travel to many places. And I had been in Turkey for about five months. And in that process, I had gathered some past life memories. I had been to some amazing places on the earth, uh, which I'll talk a little bit about later. And I felt very connected into the land. And it was time for me to intuitively move to another country. So I went to Israel and I went by boat. On the way on the boat, I bought some water as we do on boats and my, I had a, an upset stomach. And uh, two months later, when I was in Israel, I realized that what I thought was a consistent nagging issue from having um, drunk water that was contaminated was actually an issue in my pelvic area, uh, which um, I went to see a few specialists. And one of them uh, told me that I had a cyst on an ovary. And... Uh, he saw me in the morning and he said how large it was and he said I needed to be careful that it didn't twist or turn or do anything or rupture and if it did I should get emergency help straight away and he basically suggested that when I leave his office I take care, I stay quiet and see if it could settle by itself. I left his office and as I was walking towards a car where someone was going to pick me up and take me back to the community I was living on, I was thinking to myself, well, I wonder how careful I should be. Is walking okay? And I also wonder what would happen, like how would I know that it's ruptured? What would be the signs of that? It turns out, it was really, really obvious. So that night, the cyst ruptured, other things happened, and that's when I had what I call the NDE. So it was about half past 10 at night. I was in the room that I was 
staying in. I'm laying on the bed. And I had been feeling uncomfortable in my stomach and pelvic area for quite some time. And I felt like something suddenly wasn't right. Like uh, someone had um, somehow given me a whole load of drugs all of a sudden. And so I was... I couldn't breathe properly. I was in pain. There was a searing pain that went through my body. But it was like there was either too much adrenaline or not enough adrenaline. Something wasn't quite right in my body. I could feel it straight away. And then there was the pain. So I thought, okay, this is probably what the specialist has been talking about. So I focused on my breath. And I focused on staying present. So I wasn't frightened. I wasn't nervous in any way. But I was aware that my body was going into trauma. And the best thing for me to do, I felt at that time, was to breathe through it. So I was breathing through it. I called out to somebody who was in a room next door, and I asked them if they could go to find somebody to get help. And I knew on the community that I lived on that there was a community nurse, and I asked if they could go and find that person. So it's half past 10 at night. I'm focusing on my breathing. I'm staying calm and just um, managing the pain. I don't know how long it was, but the nurse um, came and they found a vehicle. Uh, It was a community where you kind of had to ask permission for things. It wasn't your own ownership. So they found a car and a student doctor who studied in the village, uh, in the city, uh, about 30 minutes from where we were, um, also lived in the community. I didn't know. He drove because he could drive and she could then manage me from the front seat. So we got to the car and it was a small car, um, quite tall. And the woman who was the nurse said to me, just lay down in the back seat. And it was tricky for me to lay down because I'm tall and I would have either way had to even either lay on my side with my knees buckled or lay against the door with my knees bent. I also instinctively knew if I lay down fully, I wouldn't be able to breathe and I wouldn't come out of it. So I rested my body as comfortably as I could on the door of the car with my knees bent. It's night time and um, I rested my face against the window And I was looking, I wasn't really looking anywhere. I was just breathing and um, focusing on my breath, but feeling the cold air or the coldness of the window on my face and feeling the relief of that because my body felt like it was on fire, as well as trembling, as well as struggling to breathe. And as I was focusing on that, and again, just being really aware of my breath, I felt like a big blue eye was sitting at my third eye or my crown. It was in that area. And I was just looking at it, and I guess you could say it was looking at me. (laughs) And I was concentrating on my breathing. As I was noticing that, I began to rest my head on the more strongly on the window and I could see out into the night sky so I could see all the stars and I began to realize that I was actually with each breath I was leaving my body and I was not so much doing it slowly but I was aware that it was happening and that the blue eye had something to do with that and was almost like pulling me out or compelling me to leave one or the other. It had something to do with it, but it wasn't necessarily a force that was um, had control over me. And so I became aware that I was moving out of my body and then I could see the car below me and I could see the three bodies in there, one of which was my body. And I could see the tops of the trees and the car driving along a road. And then I took another breath and then I was out even further. And I was then, I have no idea how high I was, but I could see the roads and the the lit roads that at nighttime roads are lit up. 
I could see a big city somewhere in the distance, which we were heading to. And I could see almost like what you'd see if you were in a drone. This was before drones existed. Um, so it was like looking like that. And I was going higher and higher. And then I took a breath um, and I was up out in the cosmos. And I could hear the sound of the audible stream, which was beautiful, but also like a cacophony. It had a mixture of both. It was a sort of loud noises, but it was also almost like musical spheres. And I could also hear the stillness. And I was moving through space and I could see the planets. I could see the shape of the planets. I could see the, the stars and the cosmos. And I was filled with a sense of, oh, wow, this is amazing. And I felt like I was coming home. And it was a beautiful feeling of, yes, this is really familiar. I'm home. It's beautiful to be here. And then, um, so there's four elements. Earth, air, fire, water, there's actually five ether. But in this experience, those four elements, because I was already in the ether, what I call the sea of consciousness, but I was now out in space in the cosmos. I thought to myself, you know, if anyone asks me a question, I know the answer to anything, anything at all that exists in the universe. And it wasn't from a place of I'm so clever. It was more from a place of absolute awe and amazement that wow this is just a so deeply profound connection and I'm home and I felt the elements one by one whip through my body and um, earth, air, fire, water and each one whipped through the body and I became aware that um, okay this this body is not the body. I wasn't in the body anyway because I was away from the body and I wasn't missing the body. But I felt it whip through my energy field. And I was like, this is amazing. And this is, I, everything is interconnected and um, I'm not a physical being. I'm not a mental being. I'm not an emotional being. I'm consciousness. Somehow I knew I was consciousness experiencing itself. And I went further into another place, which I there were there were I knew that there were other beings around, but I didn't have other beings close to me in this experience. And it was like I was in a corridors of light. Only they weren't corridors of light, but that's the best explanation I can find. But the if the ground or the walkway into them into these corridors of light was like cloud but again it wasn't cloud it was like white light so it was very strong white light and there were doors and the doors were they weren't necessarily swinging wildly in the breeze but they were open and I knew that each of those doors was connected to past lives for me and the Akashic records and that I didn't have to go into them the information was coming at me and through me. I also became really aware of who we're not. So all of the things that as human beings we think we are, we're really not that. And I had been traveling with a backpack for quite some time at that point, and I felt like I was becoming really aware of the things that we think are real and how heavy they are on our back. What a weight we carry with the belief systems of those things. And it felt like I was letting that backpack go. And um, in that light, I felt deeply, deeply connected. I felt like I was um, at one with everything. There was no separation. I could hear, see, feel everything and smell things as well. And that um, I had this deep knowing uh, that in a way has never left. And then 
I was continuing to just experience that and be in that space. And I felt something tug at what would have been my body. And the woman in the front seat had realized that I wasn't breathing and that there was no pulse. And she was trying to get my pulse to work by massaging my neck and massaging my wrist. That made me jolt back into my body. Um, I felt like I hadn't made a decision about leaving or staying. I and and then we ended up in the, at the hospital. I got some emergency treatment, and then over the next three to four days, I periodically kept leaving. I found it difficult to stay in my body. Uh, it was like the experience itself had changed the frequencies to such a degree that what I call the oversoul, and I that word was the thing that came to me. I hadn't really thought about whether there was an oversoul before, but the oversoul couldn't um, couldn't stay connected until I'd found a way of bringing it back in and then taking it back out again. And that will make sense a bit later when I talk about some of the things that I do now um, and uh, in response to that. So... I spent a few days leaving and then coming back in, leaving and then coming back in. And then by about the second day, second or fourth day, something like that, I absolutely knew that what I needed was water. And I didn't need water to drink. I needed water on my body to help the electrical frequencies and the oversoul get back in and stay in. So I wasn't well enough to walk, so I, sounds very dramatic, but anyway, I crawled out of bed and crawled along the floor, um, went into the bathroom, and um, that in itself, it that action in itself felt exhausting. So I reached up to the tap, leant against the wall of the shower, turned the tap on, and then just let the water come in. And once the water came in, I felt like the electrical frequencies started to do their thing that they do when they're around water, the healing and the balancing and the harmonizing. And then I um, turned the tap off and I went back to bed and I it felt like my recovery was beginning from there. And then after that, I needed to get well. I needed to... Um, integrate more and I also knew that I needed to I was from the UK I needed to go back there for some treatment but I needed to get well first and in the process of that just keep integrating that experience in whatever shape or form it took I also knew it was time to um, do some investigations of um I'd already investigated past lives. I'd, I'd already been on what I would call a spiritual journey and perhaps even an esoteric journey. Um, so I'd been investigating the soul and I was very oriented to the soul. And my soul was now saying, okay, so now remember this and remember these things and do some studying so that you begin to remember and integrate those things that you've done in previous lives, which you've come to do in this life. Uh, and then I, so I ended up going back to the UK to get some um, medical treatments. And then I began to um, do a whole load of things that were really um, about remembering who I am, remembering who we all are, and um, letting go of that which we are not. And I went to some mediumship groups so that I could remember my skills in mediumship and clairvoyance and um, clairaudience and clairsentience. I uh, did some more study in past life regression and began to do a lot of that because I'd had the, I was starting to have this total soul recall of all my past lives. And I knew that that was important for me and for others too, but in, in the sense of the deeply personal thing for me, this was about what I needed to do. Um, studied uh, shamanism, healing, 
all of that energy was really active. So it was like uh, re-honing my skills. And then I also began more consciously working with the earth. So I was already interacting with the earth. I was also already working um, with um, the earth in healing and communicating to the earth, communicating with animals and plants and trees and rocks and the cosmos and um, angels. And that began to take a different shape and form. It became because my frequencies had changed permanently and they were meant to change permanently. I believe this was a trigger from my soul in order to make sure that I really, um, I think I would have done the work anyway, but I think this was to make sure that I could do it while I was still in the physical body because it's high frequency work and it was um, important. And another thing that I learned during the experience was that love is the foundation of everything. Love is all there is. There is nothing else but love. And everything else is love the sky. And so it was about bringing that forward, working with people. I also realized that there is a cosmic agenda for um, the potential for individual awakening for every single person on the planet. And it's an ancient agenda. And we have come close to those that that collective awakening in the past and each time we get close to it we somehow don't manage to do it but in this particular incarnation for many of us there's that chance that this may happen and so that's been a fundamental aspect of what i've been a part of is preparing things helping people to be who they are heal their bodies and their minds and spirits recognize who they're not um, and work with the earth to, as an esoteric map maker, to assist in her process of ascension. She's chosen to bring us all with her, take us all. We're all invited if we choose to go for this journey of her becoming a star. And to work with uh, different guides and different beings and master ray energies. And cosmic beings and all sorts of things so I interact with what people would call ETs I interact with um, cosmic beings master energies um, Jesus energy Christ consciousness energy um, I want to say anything and everything but I'm careful about that because it's not about anything and everything it's it's beings that are high frequency of a love vibration but within that, so many beings are high frequency love vibration that we don't even register our living beings. Um, and and also my skills in the mediumship um, just went uh, to a level where I've not really met um, many other people who work in the way that I work. That, and that doesn't mean there's not a lot of people who work in um in frequency and vibration but for me it's a i interact with the soul consciousness of the earth and soul consciousness of individuals and it's a, something that is hard to explain because it's a non-verbal telepathic thing and it's an energy and frequency thing um but as the world is changing and as more and more people are becoming aware that a near-death experiences occur out-of-body experiences occur spiritually transformative experiences take place all the time um, and more and more people are beginning to wake up to a different level of consciousness and I'm not talking about woke I'm talking about a, a spiritually awakening um, that is something that has become more plausible for what I can do and what I came to do and and I also follow a mystical path that would be one like the Holy Grail um, and the and other esoteric paths that I kind of unite together. So that's um, kind of what um, I do. And then I work with people um, 
for one-to-one and groups. I work with the land and different frequencies in the land and different places in the cosmos, different stars and different planets, different beings, and um, help people do their cosmic memory, develop their cosmic consciousness, and do what I can to be part of that and be a positive part of that. Um, I do write some articles and uh, do other writing and I paint like these paintings behind me. They're just on my wall. Um, they're about some of the experiences with Earth energies and how they show in the cosmos. Um, so that's kind of it, really. Are these paintings uh, things you saw during your NDE? They are extensions of that. So when I first came back, from the NDE, so to speak, if you ever do come back. But that um, I was drawing a few things and um, I had studied art for four years. So after drawing and after doing the art studies for four years, um, I was tired of my artwork being judged, critiqued. Um, you need to do it this way, you need to do it that way. So I had kind of lost not lost contact with it but had not wanted to do it for a while because I didn't want to be judged and assessed for it but after I came back from the NDE I I was drawing um, the blue eye um, and the tree of life and various other things that were very connected to that experience for me and then from that I began to uh, tune into energies that were present in the cosmos that would want to be shown so sometimes it's so abstract that it doesn't like this one this one here um is the energies in the earth but also the energies in the cosmos and how they communicate with one another and i tend to use spirals and circles and dots in all my paintings and they manifest differently and so sometimes um, they're the pathways through the um, other dimensions that we can follow in order to return back. And that's something that I didn't mention, which has now come to my memory, is that the four directions, I'm, when I came back from the experience, I, like I said, I knew that NDEs existed, I knew that past lives, they were all something that as a child I'd experienced and I'd had very, some interesting experiences through my childhood. Um, so it wasn't um, a shock to me in that, oh my God, I didn't th think these things existed. It was that um, <clears throat> now you've had this experience, <coughs> excuse me, even if people don't believe in it it's okay because you know fundamentally at the deepest part of you that it is real this is such a direct experience that you don't have to have a an argument about it you don't have to try to prove it which I wouldn't have done when I was younger I would have just kept it to myself but this was like this is this is absolutely real this is what you've come to do and in that process of the dying with the four directions the elements in the investigations I did, and there was a lot of research going on at the time about NDEs, and there was um, almost a qualitative experience of it uh, that that they were bringing into the ex exploration of it. So did you go into the light? Did you experience a tunnel? Did you see people you knew when you died? All of those things. Um, I felt that there wasn't an exploration around consciousness and what that meant as our essence of Christ consciousness, but also the cosmic consciousness of who we are before we become this person and before we leave this person and so on. And so the the, the four elements had something to do with that. And I didn't come across anyone else, and I'm not saying there isn't someone else, but I hadn't come across anyone else that had a had had a similar experience so I knew this was unique for me and I knew that it was important and that over a period of time it would become clearer 
So it doesn't didn't feel like it was muddy and I didn't understand. It just felt like there was going to be a process of understanding. And um, in my shaman, shamanic studies and the work that I was doing with the different energies, the elements, the earth, air, fire, and water, and ether, were very present. They would show me teachings about different things. So there was that aspect of it. But I also knew that it was something about how we leave matter when we leave the body and go back to source and then how we rematter or rematerialize when we come back in again in another form and that these four elements have been and five elements have been part of indigenous cultures all over the world and they are part of how we can navigate the afterlife and safely navigate the afterlife as well and I was at a um, Buddhist conference many years later and uh, there was a, one of the monks was talking about the death and dying process. And in that process, he talked specifically about the studies that they undergo to learn about how to release energies in earth, air, fire and water. And I thought, yes, that's that's connected to the experience I had. So then it also taught me that I I must have done that before. In other lifetimes, I must have navigated that before to have done it this time um, and without help and to do it and that there was something about that that was important to what I might be able to share with other people and also using my own experience for total soul recall. And so that the full cosmic memory becomes a part of who each of us can be. And uh, that relationship has developed. And with the master energies and the cosmic rays, that has developed. And in the experience of the frequency changes, the master energies work can work through this field, this body, and can teach no they but they can teach me things but they can um we can work together as colleagues to do the things that they may ask me to do or that need to be done and they work with the different colored rays and most people are born with one ray specific to their ray of service and that service maybe in education, maybe in teaching, it may be in healing, it may be in um, uh, this, there's a whole load of different rays of service. And so this body was primed to be able to work with the different rays and different beings and still maintain the frequency. And if you like in, in that holy grail, like stay, stay on the horse. Stay on the horse, not come off the horse when you're working with the energies. Um, another thing that I also realized was, and this is to do with it being a trigger by the soul, the near-death experience could have happened in three different places on the planet. Each place it happened, it would have had a slightly different imprint because the land herself would be also working with me through the heart connection and the soul connection. So for me, it could have happened in Peru. It could have happened in Malta. But it happened in Israel because the timing was right. I was in the right place and the right age. It was all pre-planned, pre-triggered. And in Israel, there was the connection to the Christ consciousness energy that was important for the manifestation to come through. And that the other places have, have the Christ consciousness energy as well. Um, but it would have been a slightly different imprint from each place. Uh, and uh, so in the work that I've been doing with the land and with the collective consciousness and the individual consciousness of each of us and our souls and so on, um, go to places and interact with the different beings, interact with the land, and then bring it back to an understanding, hopefully for people and for myself, about what's really going on with all the changes, the earth changes, the consciousness changes, 
the the very interesting things that have been happening on our planet in the last number of years that are, are causing great grief and struggle in people. And um, so one of the places um, in connection to a whole load of other places on the planet was I went to Malta and worked with the Goddess Temple. And that for me connected into other countries I've worked, I had worked with before and land energies I've worked with since. And then when I was on the plane heading back to the UK, I had a booming voice come through that said, you must write about this. And I went, I don't think so. (laughs) I don't think that's for me. And uh, they went, no, you write about this. And so um, that became something that I uh, began to think about how I could best write about that. And then it became how I could best share information about that. If I'm not writing about it, is it through conferences and other things like that? So it's been a progression of really my own journey, but how I can share that. And I don't always know I've got that sorted, (laughs) but I'm on my path and I stay on it. I can't help but wonder... um why your doctors just let it rupture like wasn't it something that he could take care of before it ruptured was this ovarian cyst Mm. well i guess that's the question i don't know the answer to i mean i could go as a soul and say well i was meant to have that experience and if the so if the rupture if the um if it had been taken care of somehow, which, and I don't know whether that would have been through some kind of hormones. Uh, there was no suggestion of that um, uh, or through some kind of surgery. I'm not sure, but that didn't happen. So um, it was also um, the consultation was done um, uh he didn't speak English very well, and I didn't speak um, Hebrew very well. So there was an interpreter there. Um, and who knows what can happen in interpretations? Um, anything can happen. And I've worked with interpreters in all sorts of other work that I've done because I've worked in mainstream things as well. And you don't always know that what you think, what you said is completely interpreted and you don't know what you've heard is what the other person said Uh, but what I predominantly remember from him was he said you need to be careful anything could happen at any time and if it twists and it or it ruptures it's an emergency so maybe he did the minimum I mean be careful (laughs) what are you supposed to do (laughs) come on come on how do you keep a cyst from rupturing? And did it cause internal bleeding? Is that what happened? Uh, yeah, and it caused, um, it also, because whatever was in the cyst was toxic to the body. So that also caused some of that toxic shock. And I, you know, I had to have surgeries and things when I came back and um, and also other things happened as a result. And, and, you know, the frequency changes have been interesting because I have to be really careful around things like technology. Because uh, if it can go, it will. Yeah, and I don't understand why that. It, like, I can't wear a watch. And my husband has noticed that when we're together a lot, his watch starts losing fifteen minutes. Uh, when he used yeah. to work, he knows when he go to work, his watch would work fine. But whenever we were together a lot, it's like uh, I can't wear one. I gotta run out the battery or something. They just they just stop. So. Yeah, something in our frequencies changes. And, you know, it may have been something we already had anyway. And then it just kind of became a bit more obvious afterwards. But um, the frequencies are very odd in certain situations. And uh, I remember once I was doing um, a an online session with somebody. And um, we were on Skype, I think. And... Uh, uh, it was the middle of night, the night where I am, and it was the middle of the morning where she was. And 
So we're doing something and all of a sudden everything just died and I was left without a computer and in the pitch dark. And I was thinking, well, I can't even connect with her to say I was really sorry. <laughs> like what was happening between the two of us? And I was helping her with some energy work. So between the two of us. Anyway, it took me about 15 minutes to get back online and get some power organized and figure out that my computer hadn't blown and all sorts of things like that. And God bless her, she was just sitting there <laughs> thinking, well, you disappeared. And I thought, she'll come back. So I came back about 15, 20 minutes, maybe half an hour later. And then 10 minutes later, it happened again. <laughs> And then she was waiting again and she said, if it happens again, though, I think I'll go to bed this time. So I have to, you know, we have to be careful with our frequencies. And the higher the energies are, the um, the more things can play up. And, you know, t that, another thing about it was time, timelessness, and that time is a concept that humans have created, but it's actually not real. And in, I was talking to somebody the other day, actually talking about uh, something that I that, that occurred to me for about six years. And I was, um, well, maybe not six years, but a period of time I was being taught about matter and how matter changes and time frequencies um, are irrelevant. And so I had things like one morning I was I was due to be leading a conference somewhere. And my alarm didn't go off and I had an hour and a half trip to get somewhere. And I was actually waking up at the time when I should have left half an hour ago to do that hour and a half trip. And I needed to get myself organized over. So I knew I was going to be late. And while I was driving there, I thought, well, I'm going to be late. But I think it would be great if I could get there on time. And I just placed that there. And I did that hour and a half journey according to my clock in about 35 minutes. And I got there before the person who needed to open up the building for me to go in there and set up arrived. Um, and then I had experiences where... Um, and I used to practice, I had a long drive at one time and I used to practice things in the car. And then I stopped doing that because I had so many experiences in the car that I thought, this is a little bit dangerous here. <laughs> um, and I, I used to drive a very small car and I was on a freeway and there were in a, in a section where it goes from, say, five lanes to four. And so everything gets congested for a while. And I had a big lorry or truck to the right of me, big lorry or truck in front of me, white, one right behind me and one to the left of me. So I, I was feeling quite small in this car and like I hope they'd seen me. And as I was having that awareness of I'm small here and I hope they've seen me, the, the lorry on the right just put his indicator on and moved to the left. And I thought it hasn't seen me. It's going to run over the top of me. And as I thought that, I heard this pop. And then I saw us all in the same place, but at different frequencies of that same place. And all of us were stacked together in different frequencies. And then everything just kind of settled back down again. And I remember thinking, well, whew, I had that experience. I don't know whether any of the lorry drivers or truck drivers had that, but I did. Um, and I don't think I'm going to practice this while I'm driving anymore. <laughs> So I had a whole series of things and it was, and then I'd have a, a full fuel tank and then I'd go around a bend and the fuel tank would empty completely. And it would be about mind over matter. It would be about if you did empty out of fuel, what would you do? Would you believe that there could be, could, that fuel could re-manifest? So all those lessons that our spiritual selves and our soul selves teach us if we're open to them. My husband was with me um, when I, we had one strange experience one night. He's not had any experiences at all, but he was with me. He still said, I don't understand what happened. Um, we were coming home. It was, uh, I think it was like Christmas Eve right before Christmas. It was dark, and I was getting over the flu, and he was just starting to get the flu. 
and I wanted to drive because he was starting to feel sick. He says, no, you're sick. So he drove. So I'm busy looking at my phone and I look up. I don't even know where we're at because I'm so involved in my phone all the way home. And we're on our road, almost to turn off our road. And we're in bright lights. And I'm thinking, did we pull in some big gas station? Because where we live on the way home, there's none of these big gas stations like Flying J or wherever. It's like these big lights, you know, small gas stations. I'm like, where are we? And I looked up, like, why is this bright light? And it was this long row of cars um, coming the other direction. It's two lane, and we're heading home to get ready to turn off. And the bright light was all of a sudden in this thick, traffic because you not thick traffic on that road um was a car passing and the mm -hmm. lights was right in our face this car was passing this long line of traffic but we were in that lane you know and i'm like thinking you know that quick oh we're gonna be hit and i look at my husband and i'm thinking he's so sick i think his delayed reaction we don't realize we're about to be hit there was no word spoken between us he's looking and I'm thinking all these stops real quick. And I think to myself, well, I was hoping to be on Dr. Oz someday until my ADE. <laughs> and I'm like, God don't want me to do that. And I thought of, you know, things I had coming up the next day about <laughs> new death experiences I wanted to do. And like, you don't want me to do that. And then all of a sudden it was, I didn't see a hand, but it was like a hand or something. Just push that car. Like cars can't go just cycle. Uh -huh. Yeah, you know, yeah. back in the and there was no room for it to even go. These cars were back to back, but it just suddenly was sideways. Yeah, in that other lane, we weren't hit. There was no screeching. There was no neither nobody break. And I just held a hold of my husband, and we turned off on our road to come home. And I kept looking at him, and we're like, we don't understand how that happened. You know, mm -hmm. either one of us, like, how did how did we re not hit? How did that car go in there? And we come through our front door and I was still like this shock. I like, are we ghosts? Like, were we, did we die on impact back there? And actually there's this big accident. Yeah. And like, are we yeah. ghosts walking our house right now? Because how are we, how are we, how did this, how did we not get hit? You know? And so it's like the only experience he can say that he had some kind of weird experience that he don't know what happened. Yeah. And it's crazy isn't it because um there's ways we can make sense of that and there's some ways we just can't and um i actually wrote a chapter for, uh there's a man who's um done um he has a website called i think it's called a greater reality and he talks about consciousness and contact experiences and i wrote a chapter for that about some of my experiences and as i was writing them i kind of thought oh, oh yeah i forgot i hadn't forgotten about that but yes okay that and so there was a the, in in this process of like you had that experience, which is well, we could find a logical way perhaps for some of these things to find a way and a settle and a meaning, and others just don't make sense. And is that in in a logical way? So is that a guide coming in? Is that something as part of our soul that is a way to help us understand that what we think is real isn't always real? Uh, I think there's always really interesting lessons and I lived in Spain for a while and I um, worked in a retreat center and part of my job was to pick people up from the airport which was about two and a half hours away and then bring them back to the retreat and I'd have people coming from all over the world to attend a retreat and sometimes I'd run workshops at the retreat and or just look after the people and uh, um, I had a few very strange things happen one of which was um i picked up people from a plane and so i had to wait for so like there may be four planes that came in before everyone who i needed to take back to the retreat center was there and the last plane that was coming in on this particular day that i was waiting for two people they'd had a rough flight apparently it had been very bumpy and stormy and so i we got into the car. I was the only car left. My, the car that I was driving was the only car left in the um, airport car park by the time that we got got out. 
you get in the car, the two of them who'd had the bumpy flight were like, oh, thank God we're on terra firma. It was so bumpy and I hate flying the best of time. And I started the engine and drove forward and out of nowhere, there, had, there was nothing. There was just this big building and the car we were in. There was a bus coming straight towards us. And I thought, well, the bus hasn't seen us. And I thought, well, that's okay. I'll go around to the right. And I went to go to the right and there was a pole. <laughs> and I thought, where did the pole come from? And I could feel everyone in the room, in the car, in that sort of sense of, uh, oh, my God, we're going to be hit by a bus. And uh, so I swerved to try and miss the bus and we connected at the back of the vehicle and the front of the bus. And my Spanish wasn't great. And I thought I'm going to have to get out and have a conversation about who did what to whom in this thing and look after the... So I immediately looked after the clients and then I had to get out. And uh, they said, no, no, you just go off and do what you need to do. And um, one of the people that he not badly hit his head, but the bump was enough that he'd hit his head on the roof of the car. So nothing major, but just more that shock, thank goodness. And I got out and went to the back of the car thinking, oh, I've got to talk to this man in Spanish. I've got no idea exactly how to do that. I'm going to have to talk to the people who are in the retreat and say there's a, been damage to the car. I'm going to have to do some reparation work here. And the man got out of the bus and he was furious with me and I couldn't understand everything he said, but I knew enough to know that he was really, really ticked off with me and that how could I be so stupid to hit him? And so he's mid-throes of absolute anger and hostility and we go around to the area where the impact had been made and the impact was big enough that our car was lifted up and went like that a bit and everyone was shaking around and the people in the bus were shaking around. There was not a single scratch on either vehicle. And he stopped mid-annoyance because he was bewildered. And we just went, oh, everything looks okay. And then he looked under his thing properly and I looked under my thing properly because there was both of us going, well, there's not a scratch. Got back in the car and drove and the people said, oh, so how much damage is there? And I said, there's nothing, nothing. It's completely okay. Not a single tent. <laughs> and there were a whole series of experiences that I had in Spain. And there was a mountain energy that was very present. And I think she was part of that too, of like I was in con communion and connection with her. And as well as other guides, there were just all these lessons. So maybe in your experience with your husband, there was a lesson being taught there or shown, not taught, shown, that will at some point become absolutely clear for you and your husband. It's amazing the world we live in, isn't it? Yeah. And and I did end up being on Dr. Oz um, after that. And so that well, was weird. And it so was you so, did know. Yeah. And so that was so strange too because um, I, Dr. Oz, people said that I had to have medical evidence of my tubal pregnancy to be on the show for their lawyers and case whatever. And I was like, okay. So I got home my doctor who I've had for over 30 years and um, I need, you know, the, uh, the medical paperwork on the ectopic pregnancy. And they looked and looked and my doctor called me personally. He says, Peggy, we can't find it. He says, I'd love to be able to produce this for you. I'd love for you to be on the show. He says, well, we cannot find it. And he says, everything went to, I don't know. They like disposed of records that were old and all this stuff. And I'm thinking maybe he don't want the bad publicity because you know he, it was his goof that caused you know me to have to wait so long for the surgery. Um, but but he really they were helping me, and so I went to the office and asked, "Can we find these somehow?" And so one lady's on the phone with Columbus, uh, which is two hours away, the big city, and trying to find out are they on microfish or something? Can we? How can we locate these records? And then this other little girl, she's on the computer and she's like, we can't find it. We can't find it. We really want to help you. And let us know when you're going to be on the show. We want to watch, you know. And all of a sudden, I just stopped. I'm like, I need these records. And I said a silent prayer. And I said, God, I need these records. 
help us find these records. All of a sudden, like this voice said to me, well, you mentioned it to him in your last appointment, which I had not mentioned it to him for 30 years. And I had said that last appointment, I, I took my husband with me and I said, I wanted to tell you something for 30 years. He said, well, you better tell me then. And I told him the brief version of my NDE. And he said, I believe you. So I've come to believe all my years of, you know, being a doctor that, um, of what you're telling me right there. And there's, oh yeah, he does too. And I, something told me, you brought it up in your last appointment. See if he meant, made a note of it. So I asked the girl, I, this on the little girl's on the computer while the other one's on the phone with Columbus. I said, can you check my last um, appointment to see if he mentioned it in the notes? She goes, okay. Oh, mm -hmm, it's right here. <laughs> it was on there where we discussed it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the, he says the ectopic pregnancy, we discussed the ectopic pregnancy, which was done by me and blah, 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 blah. I was like, yeah, that's all I needed. <laughs> amazing amazing you yeah. know i could have just gave up walked out they can't find it i can't be on the show but i was like i gotta be on that show i just got to yeah i gotta tell my nde it's like i just for me it's a, a christian thing you know to share uh -huh. my NDE. and so it's interesting you know i hear you and i've heard so many other um in the ears and it's interesting and in fact i just said to uh, i was oh, a few months ago i spoke for uh Ions in Texas, and it's on YouTube, Houston Ions, and I had said, I separate the NDE from the nde -er. I listen to their experience, and then I listen to what they have made of it since their experience. Mm -hmm. Like you, you went to a mediums, you looked it into this different avenue, and where other person might be quoting the Bible from their NDE. And another person might be atheist and, and saying this proves this and that. And you know, another will say, so therefore, and others will be reading these new age books and say, well, now it's be, it's because of this and that and, and going on all these theories and stuff. And it's what we make of it. But the experience is the sacred part to me. I kind of look at it a bit as separately. And then I yeah. listen to the person and what they made of it. You know, you made your art. You know, um, other people, um, you know, some in the ears suddenly one day, I think it was a doctor, and all of a sudden he started playing music on the piano. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, it's like we all um, take take it and make of it what we will, but the experience is like, I think, the meat of of what science, I hope, someday takes with it and, and starts to find out, you know, explore the other side they're spending all this money on these spaceships when you can explore the other side just by believing and understanding and researching people that have experienced the other side because yes, we're then, coming back with gifts yeah it's interesting that because um about six years ago i did a talk um i speak at conferences in consciousness and uh indies afterlife different things and I did a talk that I, I spoke about what I believe is that these are triggered by the soul and and looked at some people who had quite big profiles in the world in, within healing or within energy work or as spiritual teachers. And many of them had had some kind of a near-death or out-of-body experience. And I was thinking, yes, this is about what we do with it and where we take it and how we share that information. And it will be unique to each of us. And that then brings me to that sacredness of it. And and it is a sacred experience. And it's they're all different because we're all different. We're all unique. And I remember when I was younger, and I didn't talk about my story for a long time, and it wasn't because it was a big secret. It was because it was hard to verbalize because it's not something that's necessarily easy to talk about. Also, uh, it's not something that I would hide as a secret, but it wasn't something that I really wanted to go into great detail about. Um, but on a number of occasions, I had people who, let's say we might be all at a, co um, a restaurant or a gathering of some kind somewhere in a 
not necessarily out in the public public, but when there's a group of people and there might be some discussion about spirituality or consciousness because that often happens in the kind of world that I live in. And then people would say, oh, yes, Paulina had an NDE, didn't you, Paulina? Tell us about it. And I would think to myself, you know, this is really fascinating because it's a sacred experience and it's not a public fodder story. And I would be happy to share, but I was also aware that what could happen would be a lot of questions would be asked which in a social setting are not necessarily um, social to answer. And also, if there was anyone in the gathering who was um, didn't believe in them, it became an opportunity for them to try to investigate my sacred experience from a scientific investigation, don't believe in it, that's not true, um, what makes you think it was real, what drugs did you take, um, was your brain, you know, maybe that was your brain um, in its last moments of death or maybe it wasn't really a near-death experience, were you hallucinating? And so I can com I can understand why people do that, but I realise that for me this is something other than a need for it to be itemised, calculated upon, uh, placed into a, um, an investigative, scientific um, investigation that really takes tries to take away the sacredness and the magic and miracle of it, the wonder of it. I think any scientific investigation is going to have to be open to the miracle and the wonder and the sacredness of it, because I think a lot of them refuse to go there. Like, you know, say if they're a hardcore atheists, they're, they could be the best scientists in the world, but if they refuse to see that this and this and this equals the only conclusion is the sacredness, the holiness, the wonder, yes. the magic. Mm. If they are going to close their eyes to that, they're never going to find the answer. Yes, because they're missing the connection and the grace that goes with it. They, it's it, it becomes a head space of understanding rather than a heart and spirit and soul space of understanding. And the deep changes and the deep profound um, interconnectedness that happens for people around it. I mean, it really does change people's lives. I think that the, um, the people that are having the experiences close to death in hospital settings where they can record it, um, people with Alzheimer's or serious um, brain wow. injury where they should have no and have not had any brain functioning that short time before their death, they have these experiences and recall them, tell them, and it's beyond the scientific understanding. And so the only conclusion they can come to now is, yes, consciousness does live on. That yeah. it is outside of the brain. And I think of that why we remember our NDE so well and they never fade is that they're, we're remembering from our soul because we weren't in our brain, we we're in our body. We're remembering from our soul, and which is a limitless, flawless land of miracles you know place to remember and you know after my second NDE I suddenly recalled my drowning at five years old and it just uh -huh. come to me one night as of the stars it just like took me over and it just showed up in the sky like this movie screen and then when it was over just like I like let me go I was like and I asked my mom the next day did I drown when I was little yeah you did she told me why it was kept secret and etc and I had two siblings there and I could tell them what they were doing, everything that happened, because I was watching from above. So, you know, and that was in the mid 80s, after, right after my tubal pregnancy. And so I hadn't heard of NDE. I didn't think this happened to anybody else. You know, it was so long after that before I started finding out this is a thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then yeah, when I realized it was a thing, I still didn't think mine was that. 
because mine just seemed so personal and so deep. I was like, I hadn't taken it out and played with it. You know, mm. it was still tucked inside. And I think the more we take our NDEs out and just talk about them and try to find the words, try to express, try to understand, it seems we expand. It's like we're taking this little tiny bit of light and we start messing with it. And it seems like we start becoming this awareness. We can still have all these spiritual experiences and all these things go about our life and not understand them at all. But when we start to try to process them, it seems like that's when the light comes on and we can start connecting the dots and seeing them for what they are. Yeah. And uh, what have you found for yourself or is that sacred and you keep it to yourself? For me, it's God. For me, it's heaven. For me, it's Jesus. For me, it's angels. Um, and so that's that's my take on it all. And I know, you know, some other people, they could have the exact same experience. I mean, nobody has the exact same, but you know, have similar experience. The other people have drowned. Other people have had, you know, minus from internal bleeding from ectopic and have a different experience and make of it something else. You know, I didn't go talk to mediums. I didn't go read the new age books. Um, when I started hearing that kind of stuff, it kind of went against my Christian beliefs. And so mm -hmm. I you know, went in a different direction. And so, you know, at the end of the day, we have to put it in ourselves, what's comfortable for us. And, um, and mine is, you know, I was, uh, it wasn't this place of love and peace and happy to be there. I had three little kids at home. You know, I was mm -hmm. 25 years old. I, I couldn't, I was like, hell no, I won't go. Like, mm -hmm. you can't make me. And God told me it was my time. Where a lot of people were told, it's not your time. You got to go back. They don't want to go back. It wasn't me. It was like, I can't stay here. So when I was back in that wheelchair, I had this huge gratitude. But yet, my life wasn't saved yet. I knew I had like a short window of time. Like God brought me back to see if my doctor would fix me. And like, he, I felt like he only had a few hours and it ended up being that way because my doctor didn't see anything wrong. And so I said, I'm not going home because I thought I might have my boys find me dead. So he said, well, I'll just spend the night if you want to. So she's an hour away, but kind of like, look at my husband, like, what is wrong with her? And so the next morning, we took back down the ultrasound. That's when they see the internal bleeding going my entire abdominal cavity part of my chest. Wow. And they said it's the biggest tool of pregnancy they ever saw. He said, you're famous around here. There'll be doctors sticking their head in to look at you. And I don't want to hear it. You know, I lost my twins in that. But I'm sorry about it. that. But I wanted to talk to him for 30 years because he stayed by a gynecologist. And I just couldn't. Couldn't. I would try so many times. I couldn't open my mouth and talk to him. I thought, he's busy. He's going to think I'm weird. And then finally, I, I took my husband with me. I said, I'm going to tell him today. And so I told him in the elevator, going up, I said, I'm going to try him today. Make sure I try him today. And so I'm so glad I did because I wouldn't have had that in the records the, the very next year. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's interesting because um, there is a sense sometimes of um, it's it's consciousness experiencing itself, or it's all meant to happen in its own way. And the more we get out of the way, and often the easier it is. And so, I when with the mediumship, I actually didn't go and listen to mediums because most mediums who who are great mediums that, but when I go to See, if I went to see a medium, they wouldn't necessarily tell me something that was useful to me. So I needed to recognize my own skills in that area and bring them forward. And so the, that process of those experiences was to not keep them at the back or from a past life or from something like bring them forward. And whatever your experiences are, it's like bringing that fully into this life for you, isn't it? And and your experiences with your husband, your children, other people, all the things that you've done, they become the thread amongst, amongst who you are, the golden threads of you. Yeah. And, you know, I get a little frustrated with, People will think all NDEs have to be like I say, New Age, 
And then other, they don't want anything Christian. Like they'll say, don't say God, don't say Jesus, don't say afterlife. And then other, now they have finally, <laughs> which I don't know if it's a good thing, but they have um, some NDE podcasts that are strictly Christian. Oh, okay. And they're But they're taking it so far. Like the guy that's doing it, I think most people think he's the next Messiah or something. He's having prophetic dreams of the end of the world. And uh -huh. he's getting huge, huge ratings. Really? Gravitate to that fear yeah. of the yeah. end of the world. Yeah. Like they want the end of the world because they think they're the ones going to heaven. Everybody else is going to hell. <laughs> so, you know, there's yeah. that. And then you have the other end where we don't believe in hell. Everybody goes to this wonderful place and they want you to believe there is no God. And, and so there's... There's people trying to own NDEs. Yes, yes. Make a claim on it. Yes. Mm. And trying to use them to say this and this for their political agenda. Mm -hmm. So therefore, blah, blah, blah. Because I had it. And there's people that are using NDEs to sell their crap. They wake up okay. one day and say, you know what? I had an NDE. And I'm thinking, yeah, because you need to sell the, this crap. Because people think, oh, you got an NDE. You know everything. And I didn't know people thought that till a couple of years ago. I saw these NDE groups. And people were coming on there asking them these questions about uh, heaven. Or what I hate the worst is they will show a picture of their dead child. What do you see when you see this picture? How is my child? And they will be answering it. Oh, I'm seeing this and I'm seeing that. It irritates the crap out of me. Mm -hmm. That people use NDEs for such bad things. To fool people, to for stroke their own ego, to sell their crap. I know somebody's in the ear and there for a few years. All of a sudden, one day, she posts on her Facebook, this big following, um, call me at this number and have your credit card. I'll charge you $100 because I talk to angels and I'll tell you what the angels say. I channel angels. Make it a killing. Um, and, you know, and, I, and I, you know, I'm in a position, you know, I have invite a lot of people to be on my show. And then sometimes in the middle of like, oh no, I didn't realize this person is using an NDE to sell this crap. And then people are telling me in the comments they want a thousand dollars for this conversation with them or they're selling this program or workshop something for like seven hundred dollars and and so i think some people just wake up one day and say i'm gonna try that um and i'll tell you something i have had indie ears that come on and they don't have much of an nde at all which is fine you know be honest that's all we're asking you know be honest and let's just discuss it. But then I'll see them a few months later. They're on this other show. And you wouldn't believe what kind of NDE they have. Yeah, it's interesting that, I isn't mean, it? They mm -hmm. exaggerated it. I mean, even one guy, it's like he fell. And his, and his life would just flash between his eyes. Uh, flash, flash in front of his eyes. That was it. You know, that was it. All he said about it. He wouldn't say how it flashed or what he saw. No. Stop. Like, okay, whatever. I didn't realize there wasn't really an NDE, you know, experience to his. He just fell. Now I see he broke his neck. Wow. Broke his neck. Had this whole big, whole recovery and everything. Like, well, that's funny. A year ago, he just fell out. He went to, he was fine and life flashed. <laughs> <laughs> and 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 some of them are absolute intentional they want to sell a, their books mm -hmm. so they create this big old elaborate in the east one and others i think they just like fooling people and this one guy was really like super mean i didn't have him on my show because beforehand he just started being really mean and i seen his youtube and it was so anti-christian so putting down NDEs. And he'd come on my show wanting to put down NDEs like, oh, we're stopping right here. And he 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 had people sending me and my husband death threats on on Facebook and stuff. Months wow. later, I see him on all these other shows 
getting the hundreds of thousands of views because he's created this great big elaborate NDE. And this is a guy that was putting down NDEs trying to disprove them. You know, I don't give names. I don't, you know, throw any people under the bus. Uh, I mean, I wouldn't have a channel if I did that. And who yeah. am I to say, right? Who am I to say? But yeah, I see stuff. <laughs> I'm sure you do. It's interesting, isn't it? In our fields, we see different things. And, and as I've mentioned, I've sp speak at different conferences. And over the years, I've watched and noticed it's almost like a... Um, a development of a Hollywood drama and fear mentality that like people who had contact experiences say or um, contact with angels or some other healing experiences, it, it becomes, it's, it's almost like uh, contact experiences now have to be um, full of drama and full of, uh, angst and full of horror and I'm not saying they aren't like that but it's like if you if you haven't had that experience that's not okay anymore you've got to have the whole kit and caboodle otherwise it's just not going to get shared um, and I remember at one conference I was speaking at there was a young woman who was getting um, video of um, craft and different things happening that um, from my point of view UFOs? yeah and from my point of view, and like if a, in, I'm trained as a psychotherapist and art therapist and different and counsellor and so on, and if someone comes and tells me they've had an experience, for me it's the uh, their reality of that experience that I work with. Now that doesn't that that's you got to be careful with that, don't you? You're nodding. You know you got to be careful with that, but it's their reality. So for me, it's not about to try and come in from that scientific and never say, well, that's simply not true because. I'm open to anything and everything, but I still have discernment. But so this young woman was having these experiences and she was ca ca catching things on film and she had some significant film of things. And throughout the last couple of days of the conference, it was like the organisers of the conference and then different people who'd come in interstate and overseas to come and speak at the conferences were trying to get a piece of this woman and what she had and what was going on. And it was it was that sense of, wow, it's it's the commodity of the experience, not the experience, not the directness of the contact or the directness of how that woman's life is changing or what it means for her to be standing outside with her phone. And then there's this craft just coming in and she's like capturing it. They start to worry about whether it was photoshopped and was she really there and who took it and how it went and how often has this been going on? And it becomes ooh, bigger than Ben Hur. <laughs> and again, it loses the connection, it loses the sacredness. Um, and whatever that means for the person having that experience gets lost, doesn't it? know somebody that was a wonderful NDE speaker. Her story mm -hmm. just gripped you. And she went, I won't say where, to tell her story. And just happened to be someone there used to work at that school where she went and knew that she no student was kidnapped. Oh, um, wow. I was told that that actually her family was suing, saying none of that was true. And that if they continue to allow this person to speak at their venues, that they would be sued because it was she was telling lies about the family. And I so, know. what's your sense around that, or do maybe you don't have sense around that? Like, is that something to do with the changes that we're experiencing, and that you know, some collective need is that the individual power, greed, or, you know, all those sorts of things, the, the sense of self, what do you reckon? Or is that something you don't share? For, for me, I think it's just moral corruption that is, exists today. Mm. I mean, I think most of us knew as kids, teenagers, young adults in our age group, that you didn't go around telling lies because people would catch you in it and never believe you again. You just knew, you know, you... Your reputation followed you. And so you try to be a good, honest person. 
But today, it seems like, especially online, I mean, these people can be anything they want to be. Mm. They can say they had this career. And I see that too. People saying they had careers and in the ears. They did not have those careers. And sometimes I'll, I'll catch them. Of course, I don't let on. I don't say anything on my show. But I'll, I used to be an investigator. I used to be a counselor and a social, mental health social worker. And I was just naturally intuitive. But sometimes I have noticed if I, um, oh, I start to talk about their career, they shut down. Even on talking to them before they come on the show, if we chat a little bit, email, whatever, and our phone, it's, and I said, oh, they said they did this career and this career. And I'm like, oh, I did that too. Because you know, I've had a lot of different jobs. And they shut down. I'm like, oh, they did not have that career. Okay. Mm -hmm. And I have actually caught people saying um, they retired in banking and get talking to them. They were a teller once for a few months. They used to work in the foster care system. Their parents had one foster kid for a few months. Mm -hmm. You know, they really exaggerate and, and you get to know some of the indie ears personally, and you find out they are just bold faced liars. And I've confronted a few and they uh -huh. say, what's it matter? What's it matter? Mm -hmm. Now, see, I'm a Christian and, and these people too are professing to be Christians so you're telling me what's it matter to be telling lies about God and heaven and Jesus? Mm -hmm. You say you saw God's face. You say you know the color of Jesus' eyes. You say God said to this. You say you sat beside God and you had this conversation. And, and I'm catching you and all these other lies. And you know, I don't know what to believe about you. And, when, and, I, and I have a problem with lies in general. And you say, what's it matter? What's it yeah. matter? Like... It matters everything. I'm trying to find a scientific evidence for this stuff. I'm trying to find commonalities in these experiences to understand them on a deeper level. And, mm -hmm. you know, where I was at, you were there too. You experienced this part of it. I experienced this and I make of it mm -hmm. of this and you make of it what you will. And I'm trying to find the truth. And I want scientists to believe us enough to where they can do studies and you hook us up to um, lie detectors or whatever. And then you got all these liars. And then you got people. I've had people tell me so-and-so approached them and said, if you lie and say part of your NDE, uh, you were told it's okay to be homosexual. We're going to have you on Dr. Oz. I'm like, this. I know this person does not have any connection to Dr. Oz. They will not get you on Dr. Oz. I can tell you who will get you on Dr. Oz. And it ain't that person. Uh -huh. They just want you to go to this group and they want you to start this because that's their politics. That's where they're trying to push everybody in this political agenda. So, and then I have people come on that aren't exactly, you know, what I would want to promote in life, but they said they had an NDE and this is what they made of it. And who am I to judge? Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, I, it's hard not to judge. They always say, oh, don't judge, don't judge. It's hard not to judge. Um, but I do. I have my secret feelings about it that I will <laughs> speak about in general. And, and I would never point out a name or, and I disguise things enough to where people wouldn't be able to say, oh, that's who she's talking about because I made it so specific. But yeah. 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 yeah it's a very <laughs> interesting, yeah, it's a very interesting world that we live in. Um, uh, in the th in the so-called three-dimensional world, even though it's not quite as three-dimensional as people think it is, <laughs> you know, um, we we as a collective community have created a whole load of beliefs about it, and also as individuals we collect and create those beliefs around stuff, and it's stuff because in my experiences, all of this is illusion anyway, which the left brain goes oh hang on a second what does that really mean if i can't if i'm not really my hands <laughs> i'm not really a body hang on i can see my hands you know the left brain is really geared towards making everything safe and certain and crisp and clear and don't let's move off that tangent at all because it's too tangential and we're gonna that's weird stub um, your toe or smash your finger you'll find <laughs> <it>. <laughs> yeah <laughs> 
Yeah, in fact, actually, it reminds me of um, shortly, not long after I'd had the near death and you know the whole thing of like not being the body. Um, I went to leave the country to go back to the UK and I went to the airport in Israel and um, they have very, or well, they used to, and I'm, I'm assuming they still do, very strict ways of getting you through customs to make sure that you weren't a terrorist or something else. This was, and and it was during a time when there was a lot of um, terrorist activity going on. Um, and so I wasn't at the best of health, and um, I was needing to stand up in the crowd to go through customs. And then what they would do was they'd have someone come along and say, "Who are you? How long are you here for? What were you doing? Why are you leaving?" and ask you all these questions and then they'd leave and then someone else would come and ask you exactly the same questions and then a third person would come along and ask you so it was really to see if you were trying to blow up a plane or I don't know whatever they thought you might be going to do and I was just thinking I just need a seat to sit down right now like um, I'm not even thinking about anything like that but so went through and then at the very last um there was still a lot of people to go through customs and be questioned. And then over the tannoy, it said, I don't remember the number of the plane and the airline, but uh, let's say whatever the plane was and the number, they put that over the tannoy. Could all passengers for this particular plane please now go to um, boarding, you know, take your boarding passes and go to the, the room the plane is about to leave. So there were about 150 people or more behind me who just, it was a free-for-all. We've all got to go through customs and get on the plane. And I thought, this is a really clever motivation if you are wanting to blow up a plane, to wait until it's so close to um, the time when the plane's going to leave. They, this is maybe something they do standardly. I don't know. Um, and then they get on the plane. So I was thinking, this is really interesting, Pauline. Where's your head going with this? And then I get on the plane and I kid you not, there was someone sitting next to me who had a handcuff around their wrist with a, with a small briefcase attached to their wrist. And that took me back to the 1970 airport movies that were quite big at the time in the 1970s where um, a plane would do something terrible would happen with the plane. So I, I was sitting on the plane and this man gets up and he trots off and he's got, the this small suitcase attached to his arm briefcase and disappears and I'm assuming he's gone to the toilet and then my brain went wow the last time I've ever seen that was in a movie and that person had a bomb in their um bag uh and they blew up the plane and I was chuckling to myself because even though I was a bit nervous about that I was thinking only a few weeks ago, you had this experience where you're really not your body, and now you're being shown that you're frightened that your body's going to die. Like, this is hysterical. So I was praying for this man to come back and sit sit next to me, and uh, he did. Uh, but interesting that even when we feel we're not as attached and we've learned something, it's almost like we create an experience for ourselves because we're such powerful co-creators aren't we you know and 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 the powers that be will give us those experiences to help us learn it's like yeah I was still very attached to being alive and being in a body while I was on that plane with that man with the uh, thing next to me and I think that's also something that I see a lot in the world is the behaviors of how, like how people behave, perhaps believing that it's okay to tell a story about having had an NDE if you haven't. Um, like if you call it an NDE and other people call it an OBE, it's still a story or if it's a spiritually transformative experience. But if you haven't had it, same as if you haven't had contact experiences or you haven't had major surgery, or, you know, all the things that people sometimes say, I've had that. I remember there was a, a woman who, during after 9-11, who became... Um, a very significant part of groups who were healing and she hadn't been there um and it it's like there's something really interesting in that that um that woman that lied about being there and she wasn't yeah 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 I remember that. 
so we as human beings we're very intriguing and very interesting and the layers of how we understand who we are who we're not how the ego works how the soul works how the left and the right brain work together and how we identify with what's important is really quite interesting and yet also sometimes it explains completely as to why the world looks like it's in such a mess i uh, grew up with a sister's compulsive liar she still is and it taught me to hate lies but also not be so gullible mm. because she loved it she loved to get everybody all worked up you know started out as ghost stories or just stories but then it was lies that hurt people I was praying for my first son. I hadn't visited my mom because we didn't get along. You know, she kicked out when I was 18. Or I got pregnant right after that. So I thought, I'm getting close to you know, time having the baby. I should go see my mom. And so I went to see her. As soon as I walked in, she says, I can't believe you're giving Terry your baby. Terry's my sister. I'm like, what? Get, what are you talking about? Give Terry my baby. Because Terry had had a lot of miscarriages. And she hadn't had a baby. Hadn't got pregnant mm -hmm. kept it yet. And I'm like, so I went to her house. I had my husband take her and I knocked on her door. I said, you're telling people that I'm going to give you my baby? And she just smirked. And she says, I forget what she said now. It's like, well, how does it feel to, I could tell you every other day, but today right now what she said, how does it feel to, how does it feel to have people talk about you? I think it's what she said. I don't know. It's something oh. stupid. And so I got back in the car and my husband's just sitting there just confused. He said, why is your sister laughing and you're crying? <coughs> she loved to get people hurt and upset. And she just had done it her whole life. But yeah, she would have been one of those people to tell. <laughs> she was there and everybody would have believed her and just, and, and a lot of her close friends are like, how do you deal with her lies? And they said, well, she's entertaining. Wow. You don't want to be entertained. You know, if I want to be entertained, I'll watch a movie that's not a true story. I don't want somebody telling me <laughs> stuff and me being gullible and believing it and feeling all these emotions and stuff. And she just she just likes to lie. And people do you think her, that has, has helped you develop your intuition or to honor your intuition? Not that I'm saying you create. I'm not trying to go you created yeah, it for that know. reason. I just, I was just, I just know I grew up hating lies. Like I would even go to the library and I'd see fiction and nonfiction. I stayed out of the fiction section. I just, like, what would be the purpose of reading fiction? Something's not true. I want to read a true story. Like, I love true story movies, too. I mean, everything, let's say, based on a true story, you know, see how much of it's true. I don't know. But I love to watch something and believe that it's true. Like, if I'm, if I'm told that it's true, I can really sink into it. But if I have a doubt, I uh, say, I don't even want to watch it. It's just like I'm worth my time. I don't want to hear made up stuff. I want to find the truth in things. I want to investigate. <laughs> I like pick yeah. at things and see how it works and get down to the yeah. meat of it. Like I had therapeutic foster kids, you know, I love to get to talk to them. And, and like my grandkids, I like to know what they're really thinking you know, and what they're really interested in. And really, I just like to get in there. And that's what I do in the podcast. Mm. I don't, I'm just have a curious mind, but I want the truth. But you know, you can't control that. People give it to no. you, or they don't. No, and there's the truth that's in each individual's truth, and then there's the truth, and then there's another truth, and there's lots right. of truths. Aren't there? <laughs> you know, it's like hanging on to those truths can be hard work. <laughs> there's a woman that uh, claimed that somebody. Um, pulled her off along the road and shot her children. And she's actually the one that shot them. And you look back wow. at those videos and, you know, she's on the TV saying, oh, this man, you know, shot my children. And and she's talking and then she'll, you'll see that smirk. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and I'm like there, and I can see that sometimes in other people. They'll be talking and they're so serious. And then, that, you know, like, I gotcha. And my sister has that. She has this. Uh, they're, they're getting this thrill from fooling people. Mm. Yeah.
my sister too on the phone i could tell her she's lying because she would take a big long deep drag of her cigarette i could hear her do it i could hear the <laughs> like the excitement in her <laughs> like she pleased me she pleased me <laughs> yeah wow a lot of lessons a lot of people around you and that's the other fascinating thing which i think is also part of that miracle of our lives isn't it that the people around us are such great providers of information and teachers about the world that we think we're living in, aren't they? And and how we take that and go, what am I going to do with this? The same as with our near-death experiences, we all go, uh, well, I don't know that this, there would be some people who go, what does that mean and what do I do with it? But I think many people that I come across who share their stories, something happens that you don't even think about what you're going to do with it, you just do it and you, you kind of run with it. And it becomes such a fundamental part of you that in a, in a way there's no separation from that and everything becomes a lesson to learn or and not like you have to struggle and have a lesson. I don't believe you have to have pain to gain. I think people do have pain and they can gain, but I don't think you have to have pain to gain. Um, but so those lessons we learn and, and, the, and the things we see around us, it's just a world full of magic and mystery layer after layer of magic and mystery and and if everyone was the same we wouldn't have the same lessons perhaps and you know the the, you know, the enlightened beings they say you know enlightenment happens in a moment in the click of a finger there is enlightenment but we can also work towards it as well <laughs> we can also take the journey of that and that for me is what i like about um life is that we are in that journey of of how we interact with everything that happens and what we learn from it and where we change, if we change, and how we grow. And some of us become broken by things and some of us become inspired by things and some of us stay broken and some of us take the brokenness. And, be, and, and in a way, we don't do any of those things because it's all just the experience of it and consciousness and God experiencing themselves, you know in as many unique ways as possible and yet every person we meet and everything we do is an opportunity for understanding who we are and who we're not yeah, and i think the worst thing we can do is get jaded mm. yeah to where you know sometimes i have to take a break from the podcast because i just start getting like numb to it or losing losing something uh, where it's not fun anymore mm. and maybe it'll be just a few bad comments or something um or for a few people i feel like this guest really took me for a ride or um i don't know whatever reasons but um but yeah i have to watch that i don't get jaded mm. you know, i used to love to watch the um i survived stories i don't anymore i can't handle that kind of drama stuff but uh, i used to love it and I would be amazed at, so this, like this one woman, she was kidnapped by this man and she was raped and he chopped both her daggone arms off and threw wow. her off a cliff and she gets up out of this cliff, you know, imagine mm -hmm. getting up out of a cliff with no arms, mm -hmm. kind of girl. And she's out in the street running for help. She can't flag down. She has no arms and the people that drove by have been helping. And I think cheated, wow. you know? Yeah where we can't stop and help somebody. I mean, yeah, we gotta be careful because there are the uh, serial killers of the world that will pretend that their arms broke or something and you help me and they get in the car and put the stuff over your face, you know. We have to be careful, we have to watch. If people don't get too close to our door and push in and all those things. But um, but yeah, I just I just try to, to, to stay in a balance to where I don't get too jaded I don't get too gullible. So. Yeah, I I respect that. And so uh, what you're doing is making a difference um in your own life, but also in in the people who watch it and uh and listen to it or however they come across it. And uh that takes time and effort and skill to do that. And uh um, it takes a lot of time in your life to do that and listening to those stories. Yes, I can understand how it would get jaded. And, and it's kind of hard not to compare yourself to other podcasts. 
and mm -hmm. you see some that you know the ones that are totally christian now he's a messiah and he's just like soaring through the roof because he's got people believing he has these prophetic dreams and visions okay that's so not me i'm not doing that and then i ha see another one that's really cool but now they're going into all the ufo stuff and channeling stuff and all this <laughs> other and in the east too and for me it's like putting into ease in a circus tent and i'm trying to keep into ease sacred but uh -huh. yet not dictate who's allowed to come tell their story uh -huh. i i mean i mean i can stay away from certain topics you know uh -huh. just focus on in the ears and um i just don't want my audience to be fooled uh -huh. you know? i don't want to ever get to a day where i think oh i know this guest for a hundred percent fact is lying but i'm going to have them on because this is going to get a lot of views yeah yeah got you yeah yeah, it's it's like you constantly gotta. I mean, that's just how my channel is gonna go. I have a conscience, and it won't be the best thing in the world out there, but it's gonna be me and how I good want to present in the east. Yeah, good for you. I think that's great, and and you know, it's like you um with that that's being true to you and being true to the sacredness of it and. You know, I do think they're, they're sacred experiences, as I've said before. And uh, um, have many people that speak with you written books about their experiences? I'm say that again. Ha sorry, have many people who've spoken to you written books about their experiences? Yes, yeah, a lot of them have. Mm -hmm. And have they talked about the process of that? Because I think that's also interesting as well, that transferring the sacredness into a book or... How do you manifest that and manage that? Because it is about finding words for things and also sharing stories. And people might have a an opinion and a thought or a judgment about something, which is deeply personal. Yeah. Well, for me personally, I had wrote down um, my life story just in notebooks, just as trying to help me deal with it because the kids is all grown. Uh, I was staying in a camper because uh, my husband was working out of town. I was no longer working, so I could travel with him. So I had a lot of quiet time, and I'd always been busy with work and school and kids and everything, playing in that big old house. And, and so I had all this time, and these memories of my childhood kept, you know, this PTSD. And I thought, okay, maybe I can write it all down, put it in notebooks. I'll put it in a drawer like I'm capturing a monster. Like, it's over there. It's in there. I, I stop remembering it. And so I got up the next morning, and I looked over at those notebooks on the mantel, at the camper and I thought it won I was like waving this white flag in my mind like everybody that ever hurt me like they won like I felt there was no justice in the world and I'm just feeling defeated like nothing ever I ever tried to do ever mattered and all of a sudden I had this vision and I I am bent over at a creek but I'm watching myself bent over in this creek from above and I'm picking up these little bits of light it's like the more I went along picking up these bits, it's like this light was growing in this kind of a dim forest. I think it was our creek that I have out here. We were home at the time. And um, I just had this little vision. And all of a sudden, it's like it's a big aha moment. It's like, I get it now. I have been, you know, how you push the abuse under the rug. I have been pushing mm -hmm. my spiritual experiences into ease and everything under the rug with abuse just the same. And wow. I felt I had to tell... The mission wasn't to tell the bad experience, it was to tell the good, but I had to tell the bad in order for people to appreciate the good. And I grabbed my laptop and I started writing. I had it done in three months, but my intention was never to publish. It was to put it somewhere in a folder and tell my kids when I die, I want my grandkids to have a copy of uh -huh. something they can pass down generations. This is my grandma's life. But when I, you know, how does it be? have other ideas because um, when I got it done, I put it in this binder. I colored this flower on the top. You know, I named it a real wildflower. Lovely. And I took it to Ian's group with me and I got it out of the trunk at the end of the show. And I showed this lady in the show, the group that has written several books. I says, look at this. This is my baby. And she's, oh, I understand. It was a Saturday. On Monday, she emailed me and she says, I want you to call my publisher. I'm like, no way, you know. And so I called him, he's a former monk, and I told him right off the bat, I says, I don't think it's worthy 
And he said, it's worthy to place your authority. Something mm -hmm. about those words was like the voice of God to me that like healed me, like made me feel like mm -hmm. you're just as good as anybody else. And so I sent it to him and he's like, I don't know how you did this. He says, it's, first of all, he says, unheard of for a first time author to have such an authentic voice. And he says, you don't tell it like, oh, poor me. He says, you just tell it. And he says, it's tragic yet divine. He says, but it needs deep, deep editing. <laughs> you know? So I had three thousand dollars <laughs> in an editor making up, wow. fixing all my mistakes. I says, but no ghostwriting. It has to be true to my word. And wow. she would start to try to change something. I'm like, uh uh, that's not the way it was. I know it. I have very good long term memory. I know all these conversations from as a kid were forward. But that person didn't say it. you can't change it. And I had some hired somebody to do a screenplay on it recently. I'm they changed everything from the very first page. And I'm like, this is garbage. I'm not reading no more of it. It's lies. Uh -huh. why, why wasn't the truth good enough? Why yeah, it's the dramatic it? impact. Because yeah. Put yourself into it and what you wanted to happen. I, I, why publish a book of, of something that never happened? <laughs> this is like garbage to me. I was upset. So. But yeah. But yeah, um, a lot of and you know a lot of people say, oh, isn't there an indie here out there that hasn't wrote a book? They're just all out to make money. And I think something about being in that bright white light, whatever you want to call it, in that space of the of the other side, I envision now that on the other side, we're all getting together and telling our stories, like maybe even to where. They can see the movie as you tell it or something. And it's so funny because that's what they're doing with the NDEs now. A lot of the podcasters are making these. I tried it and I'm not good at it. Making, using these um, visual aids and putting with their story and the music. Uh -huh. and uh -huh. I'm awful at it. But um, but they, and, and but a lot of people don't even like those because they, it says it misrepresents their story. Um. Yeah. But, but I think, I think on the other side, like when you tell your story, like you did a while ago, or if I was to tell mine, I think they would see all the visual aids. I think they would feel all of our emotions. I think it's a full 1000 D movie. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And, and I think when we come back, there's something in our soul that wants us to record this. I mean, people talk about the ash, I can't say that word records, or they'll say there's a something they call it something else all of records or, or something in heaven i don't know anybody like that uh -huh. but i think there must be i think there must be a book on a shelf on the other side of every one of our lives that someone could open up and fully you know say if it was back you know hundreds of years ago that they would be right there reliving it and, and yeah. experience and so i think when i think indie ears are just compelled or something in our soul to write even though those of us that was not writers by any stretch of the means or speakers because I was a very shy person like my ex-husband's family they'll see me now now like who are you you used to be so shy you never mm -hmm. talk now I don't mm -hmm. shut up so <laughs> <laughs> well, we have know, to have the speakers no, no, we have to have the speakers in the world, you know, I think that's really important. We have the speakers and the listeners and we have, you know, everyone's got our, we've all got our places and our roles, haven't we? And, uh, you know, it's it's wondrous if we can feel okay about whatever role we're taking at any one time. But, you know, as human beings, we always have a tendency to feel we didn't get that right or, you know, that's the journey of understanding, isn't it? The grace of being, just being able to be alive. But watching... Um, watching when um one of the things i really loved about <clears throat> art, art therapy and why um apart from the fact that it's non-verbal and it's transpersonal and it reaches into places that aren't about words when you watch people really in a process of the therapeutic art process it's right in that space of just being who they are in the moment, in the joy or in the horror or in whatever it is, without any judgment, without any design on how it should or shouldn't be. It just is. And that process is a 
beautiful thing and I always feel so absolutely humbled and um, lucky, blessed when someone shares that aspect of themselves with me. I feel like um, it's such a privilege, so privileged is the word I'm looking for. I just couldn't find it in all the other words. It, it's such a privilege to be able to be in the process of people's lives, whether they're having a good time or a sad time or a bad time or a traumatic time. And and that's such an honor. And I hope I never lose I hope I never lose that sense of honor. Yeah, yeah, even I on a bad day. I think it's rare art these days is to find a good listener. Mm. are not out there <laughs> yeah 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 we've got a claim to fame you know it's a very human thing at the moment is a claim for fame isn't it a desire for fame whatever that means and maybe it's just being the best in the office or the best at school or the best podcast or all those sorts of things the best writer uh, um, people never come to me and say, I'm, I've said this before publicly too, you know, people have never come to me and rung me up and said, oh, Paulina, I'm really worried. I'm happy all the time. I don't know what to do. I'm so happy all the time. Um, and and it's fascinating that because uh, if you were happy all the time in a histrionic way, you might be a bit worried about that. But it's always the emotions that that feel not quite settled where you know it's sadness or it's trauma or if I could only do this if I could only do that but yeah they never no one's ever come to me and said I'm really really worried I'm happy all the time and it's like I'd love somebody to come and say I'm really worried I'm happy all the time because then that's the that's the key to how to stay happy isn't it <laughs> or one of the keys perhaps I stepped out my porch one morning take a dog out and I was thinking about something and I just felt like God said to me something like creativity is what he gives us for our depression. Like that's what can bring us out of depression. And I thought about how I, after I lost the twins, I would, um, it's like God doesn't uh, give us uh, these things without having a rescue and creativity is that rescue. Because after I lost the twins, I was in this depression and I would sit and draw house plans. Because my ex said, you draw up the plans for the house and I'll build it however you want. And so I draw and draw. And like five hours ago, and it felt like five minutes. And and then later on in life, I got depressed. I started drawing house plans again and rebuild on the house. Later on, I got depressed again and, and drew up house plans. And I built all the way around the house. And so I'm walking out the dog and I'm thinking all these thoughts. And I turn around, I see this humongous house. <laughs> and I'm thinking, wow, that's a lot of depression. <laughs> <laughs> that I had realized that uh, that I had designed this house out of depression, out of my depressed times. Uh, so. Yeah, well, it, depression is fantastic, you know, as a as a teaching tool, isn't it? Obviously, you can design houses in depression, but you know, when I was studying years ago, depression was also very connected to what we were suppressing, you know, depressing in our lives and. These days, it's become very much about medicine and chemical treatments. But um, as a road to the self and self and others and self-awareness, like what are we depressing in ourselves that we find difficult to own around ourselves? Is fasc I always think that's a fascinating journey as well. I have found that it seems like, I don't know if everybody else will feel like I, and so I can say we, we, fear it you know we want to medicate it or people want to drink it or they want to run from it but we're going the wrong way instead of backing up from it we've got to go in it yeah yeah everything and experience yeah. it and whether and and find your art find when you can't help those depressed feelings but what can you do that makes you happy during the depressed depressed times you know, mine was drawing house plans or I was sewing and making dolls for a while and stuff. Um, you know, some people's painting or it's whatever. But as long as it's a healthy habit, a creative habit. And so, I don't know. I've got through life without having an addiction and I'm really proud of myself for oh, that. Okay. 
because you know I see so many people that have just Addicted. ruined their lives. Yeah, addictive behavior is a very strong pattern in humanity, in the human species, very, very much. Um, addiction to all sorts of things and addiction to distraction is a big issue. <laughs> Dis uh, be distracted in as many ways as possible is a current thing. We've gone on for a few, quite a number of years now, but um, that fear of being in the company of the profundity of self is fascinating because there's no one like each of us anywhere except us. And yet we grow up believing that, that well, many people grow up believing that to not be themselves is the greatest thing they can be. Whereas being ourselves is the greatest thing we can be because whoever we are, we're being who we are in that uniqueness of, uh, you know, the Godhead and the consciousness experiencing itself. It's profound and it's so profound that we we kind of step away from it because I think, what was it, um, uh, Marion Williamson said, you know, that we, we're so frightened by our own beauty and, and our own courage and all those things that we step away from it. Um, Nelson Mandela quoted her when he was released from jail and it's that sense of... Um, it is our own beauty and our own divine divinity that scares the living daylights out of ourselves. Excuse me, some people think they're not allowed to like themselves. Hmm. They have to, somebody else has to see it. Somebody else has to applaud it or that confirmation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, external so confirmation. Well, it's been a very nice discussion. Yeah. We end up everywhere and be so nice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so just let the conversation flow and see where it goes. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, so it's I'll been let a... you get to bed. Uh, what time Thank is you. There, about midnight? <laughs> uh, well, half past 11. It's not yeah. too bad. But, you know, um, yeah, thank you very much again for um, contacting me and having the conversation. It's been lovely. And, uh um, I look forward to listening to some more of your other um, the other people's stories and uh, and good for you for feeling that such a strength to to do it and thank to be you. determined to do it at all cost. Yay! <laughs> all right, thank you. Good luck to you. Yeah, thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.